Okay, today, now, we have a session devoted to topological data analysis, very interesting tool, by the way, very important, by Ulrich Bauer, please. Okay, thanks for the introduction, thanks for the invitation to speak here, and give you an overview uh, on the topic of topological data analysis. Um, I'm trying to make this gentle to those of you who haven't had much exposure to topology, so at some places I'll use concepts and if you don't really exactly know what they mean, you can just basically try to squint your mental eye and trust me in what I'm showing and I think, I'm trying to convey a good impression anyway, even if you don't uh, learned algebraic topology before. Um, so if you look at the slides here, part one says inference and stability, maybe I'll say a few words about this. So inference, uh, you, you know this from, from statistics, we're trying to infer the property of a shape from a sample. That's, that's one of the goals of a topological analysis, a data analysis. Persistent homology is the tool that allows us to do this kind of inference. And stability is also very uh, interesting and, and worth noting uh, because the methods I'm gonna show here have this, uh, have a property that's uh, not so common in machine learning. We have guarantees when we know something about the input and the input satisfies a certain uh, criterion, I, we know the, the input is good enough in a sense, then we are guaranteed something about the output, that the, the output captures the correct answer in a way. And that's, that's why these methods are so powerful and often they're applied in situations where you wouldn't expect that the, the thing you're looking for is actually topological and maybe it isn't, but still persistent homology captures something, it, it captures a, a wealth of information about your shape and the fact that this is so robust is, means you can abuse it, right? You can apply it even though you're not, not actually literally looking for something topological. But the topology that, that's inherent in the, in, the, in the shapes you're studying might still tell you a lot uh, about the shape itself. Um, so let's start, now this clicker stopped working. Oh yeah, okay, now it's back. So you might know this, this joke, what's, what's a topologist? The topologist is a person who can't tell the difference between a donut and a coffee cup. Um, of course, well, that's, that's an exaggeration. That's, uh, the, with jokes, there's always some, some part that is true and some part that is wrong. And if, if you look, if you don't look carefully, you think that's true, that both the donut and the coffee cup have a hole, have a handle, but if you look closer, um, then you see what the problem with this statement is, that, that the donut is actually not just, it doesn't have one handle, but it has tons of little holes. And you see them only if you bite into the donut, and then if you look at a bit closer into the fine structure. And if you look even more closely, if you go to the level of molecules or atoms even, um, you don't see anything anymore, right? You, you, you just see uh, the atoms, and they're just discrete space. They, there's no interesting topology. This is just a bunch of points with no topological connections. So in a sense, at the closest level, that's what we actually have physically. And this is also the starting point from data. We have points, we don't have a shape that's connected, but often we just have individual points. Still, if you look at this picture, you see something like a circle or an annulus or a donut, wherever, it depends on how hungry you are. And, and why do you see uh, something like a circle, right? Here's, here's, a, here's a simple but very precise way of, of getting the donut shape back. You, instead of looking at the points, you're thickening them, you p place a, a ball of, of a constant radius around each of the points, and then, well, things start to develop. So what, here you see things start connecting up, and the first observation you make, you have small holes appearing. And those holes, if, if you want, they're like the foam in the donut. And what's interesting about them, they're short-lived. If I increase the radius of the balls, these holes will fill up very quickly. And that's, that's a property we're, asking, we're looking for. We're looking for the persistence of these holes. And these small holes here, they don't persist for long. That's why, why I would call them small holes. If I thicken just a little bit further, the holes fill up again. Now a, another hole appears that hasn't been there before, and that's the characteristic uh, hole in the donut, if you want, and that remains robust for quite a while. Of course, eventually, if I increase the radius enough, there will be no hole anymore. So all the holes that appear in this process eventually will be filled up again. Okay? 
So, so that's, that's kind of the phenomenon that we try to study here. We look at the object, we look at the, the point cloud, but we look at it uh, at different scales, and we try to relate the scales to each other. And we try to, we make the observation, things appear, they're born, cycles, holes are born at some scale, and they die at some other scale. And we want to capture this, and we want to make it precise. And as it turns out, it's not that easy, because somehow it's, it's in, in high dimensions, it's not as clear as it seems in these pictures what exactly a hole is. So we, we pass to something algebraic, and actually it's, it's not so, so easy to tell what the hole is, but it's the one thing that will be well-defined is when, the hole, when a hole appears and when it dies. Um, here are another few slides that look almost the same. You see, um, now you see points, edges, triangles in this picture. So on top of the union of balls that I, you saw before, there's a simplicial complex, right? This is this, this high dimensional generalization of a graph. That's a topological shape that's uh, described in a purely combinatorial way that's well suited for working with a computer. Also well suited for algebraic purposes much better than working with these disks that you see in the background. And you, what you can also observe here in this picture is the, the cycles that you see here, so the holes that are present in the union of balls are also present in the simplicial complex. That's not a coincidence. This simplicial complex on top is in some sense equivalent, topologically equivalent to the union of balls. To be precise, it has the same homotopy type. So it's not homeomorphic. There's not continuous maps going back and forth. You see some of uh, the, some parts. I have something solid in the union of balls and something thin in the simplicial complex. But certain aspects, certain topological aspects, are captured by by this combinatorial simplification. And in particular, the the one a homology that that's an aspect that we're trying to study here. Uh, and, th and that aspect is preserved as well. Homology is something we like to work with computationally because it's basically we've got passing to the level of linear algebra. We, we're taking the complicated uh, world of topology or homotopy types here where we have undecidable problems even. The fundamental group of a, of a space is uh, de uh, determining if two spaces have the same fundamental group is undecidable. But Determining whether they have the same homology is just a linear algebra problem. So that's kind of what, in machine learning, we try to linearize everything, right? So that's why we're, we're going to look at homology. And, and homology still gives us something like counting the number of holes. And so we, we, we have, again, we have different radii here. And for each of the radi radii, we have an appropriate simplicial complex capturing the homotopy type of the union of balls. Um, this illustration that I've shown you seems like a toy example, but it's actually very close to one of the motivating applications that led people to look into persistent homology. Persistent homology means studying the homology of a one-parameter family of spaces, growing spaces. We call this family of growing spaces or filtration of spaces. And here's an application, so that, that's uh, showing uh, gramicidin, this is an antibiotic, one of the earliest antibiotics. And it functions as an ion channel. It attaches to the, to the membrane of the, uh, the cell of a bacterium. And um, it, when, when, when this molecule is attached to the membrane, you, you, ions can pass freely through the channel. You, you don't see it if you look at the, the molecule this way, but if you rotate it, then you see that there's actually a hole in the middle. And this is, in a sense, this is where the ions can pass through. And once you attach this piece, the, 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 the ion uh, gradient between the inside of the cell and the, the exterior um, is no longer maintained, and that leads the cell to die eventually. So the upshot is this molecule has a function, a biological function, and that function is actually geometric, right? because it creates a tunnel through which the ions can pass, and that kills the cell. So this came out of a project uh, led by Herbert Ellsbrunner in the 90s, uh, where the researchers tried to study uh, the geometry 
of molecules in their relation to biological functions. So the goal here was to say, okay, we have this model of the molecule. We know it serves as a channel. It has a tubular shape. We know we have topology. We, we, we know how to compute invariance of these shapes. We know how to compute the fact that there's one tunnel. So now the interesting thing is, if you just simply take this, this uh, picture here, this is also a union of balls, very similar to what we've seen before. Now you try to compute its homology. You expect to see that the answer that there's one hole, but in fact there's many. And what you see in addition to the one hole that you're looking for is what we've seen before. The small holes that appear and disappear quickly as you increase the radius. And the problem with this molecule is if you increase the radius, then uh, you will fill one hole, but then another one will come up later. I'll, I'll show you an example um, similar to this in, in, a, in a moment. But in a sense, that was the, the initial motivation for studying persistent homology. You want to you, you wanna understand um, shape through, through, described through point clouds here, the positions of the atoms. And you have to look at different scales, and you have to judge which of the holes are relevant and which are not relevant. Um, let me just very briefly recap, or give at least give an impression, if you haven't seen this, recap the notion of uh, homology. So here you see the simplicial complex again that we've seen before. This is, this is the one that actually captures the, the donut shape nicely. Um, in, in homology, we work with chains, cycles, and boundaries. What's a chain? So we, we, we work with linear combinations of the edges, and we work over the field with only two elements, yes or no, if you want. So one or zero. And so a linear combination of edges is just a subset of the edges. But here you also see each edge has a boundary. And now if I take three edges, then uh, I add up the boundaries, and I, I calculate modulo two. So here you see the two yellow dots are the boundary of this chain consisting of three edges. This looks very natural. The, the way I defined it, right? Each edge has a boundary, and then each chain, each linear combination of edges uh, gets the boundary, which is the sum of the edges boundaries. And that means I get something maybe unexpected if, I, if you look at this Y-shaped chain uh, to the right, then the, the center of this the, the place where three edges meet, this is part of the boundary, but if you have four edges meeting, it's, it's not part of the boundary. But that's just the definition. It's, it's, it's a useful way of, of uh, expressing the, the geometric notion of a boundary and turning it into something algebraic, linear algebraic, so we can compute with it. And here's something that's, here's a chain that has no boundary, and we call this a cycle. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a simple cycle, as in, in graph theory. It could also have uh, different loops, uh, like disconnected components, and you could also have uh, vertices with valence four. Any 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 even uh, vertex degree would be okay. So this is one cycle, and you can see this is the cycle that captures the hole. When I'm talking about a hole in this shape, here's another cycle that captures the same hole. And we want them. We want to declare them to be equivalent. Why are they equivalent? Because they differ uh, by a boundary, right? So if you take the green cycle here, sorry for all those who are colorblind, the outer cycle, and then you add to it the boundary of the yellow-shaped chain. Now this is a two-dimensional chain, a linear combination of triangles, and then. The green cancels out, but the, the red one remains. The one in the, in the middle remains. So the outer and the inner cycle are homologous. And that means they lie in the same homology class. And this is what we're working with. This is, this is the homology of, of this shape. It's, it's a quotient. You take the chains. Within the chains, you only look at the cycles. This is a subspace. And then you quotient by all the boundaries. So cycles, modular boundaries, is homology. That's the catchphrase. And if in, 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 in a picture, this is what, what you have, right? You look at equivalence classes of cycles that only differ by a boundary. Okay. 
and, and, and that's what we really try to capture. We try to, we, we think of these homology classes as capturing uh, the, the topology of the shape. Um, now what is persistent homology? What we've seen before is just looking at a single shape. Now we are looking at a sequence, a filtration of shapes, as we said before. So let's just look at four for now. And on bottom, I draw a collection of intervals. Here, uh, the, the way these intervals are arranged vertically has no meaning. For the, forget about the vertical ordering. All we care about is the, the intervals themselves. So when, when do they start, when do they end? And what these intervals describe is when uh, a hole appears in this filtration of shapes and when it disappears. Um, I, on top, I only show four, uh, four complexes, but remember this is a one parameter family parameterized by the radius. So there's, there's actually uh, an infinite number of different complexes appearing. And that's why you see so many different birth and death times in this picture, right? So I only draw the, the four complexes, but there's many more. And at each interval that you see here, the left end uh, corresponds to some cycle appearing and the right end corresponds to some cycle disappearing. And the way you can read this barcode now is let's look at, let's pick a radius, let's pick 0 0.1. And let's look at all the intervals that contain 0 0.1. There's five of them. And what that tells me is at this level 0 0.1, and that's the complex on top of it, there are five holes, and you can see five holes, and they're actually captured by five different cycles. And those cycles generate a basis for this vector space, the ho that's the homology of the space. Remember, that's a quotient of the space of cycles. And here you see the five cycles, and so the, the crucial thing here is the same cycles can be used uh, throughout their lifespan. And throughout their lifespan, they generate something, they, they generate a dimension in homology. And that means I can not only read off from this diagram how many cycles I have at each scale in this filtration, but I can read off more, and that's very important for us. I can relate the different scales to each other. Yeah, that's the question. Exactly, so that, the very good question. There are cycles that are not holes, there are cycles that are boundaries. So what we get here is actually a collection of cycles that pass to a basis of the homology group. So they're gonna be linearly independent as cycles, but also their homology classes will be linearly independent, is, which is what you see here. So the number of these cycles, they are basis cycles for homology, and the, they remain that throughout their lifespan. That's, that's, that's very important, that's a crucial feature. Right? They're not just uh, any cycles, but they're linear, independent, non-trivial, still in homology. And, and that's, the, that's the key thing. That's what we need to compute in, in our computations of persistent homology. We need to find those cycles. That's what it boils down to. And what it tells us, not just what's the dimension of this homology vector space at each scale, the Betty number, um, but it also tells us how different scales are connected. So what we have here is not just a diagram of different vector spaces with no connection. No, we have inclusion maps from one complex to a larger complex. And every map between complexes induces a map between their homology vector spaces. So what we have here, in a sense, is a one parameter family of vector spaces, but we also have a linear map between each vector space. And the rank of this map tells us exactly what persists, which cycles live on from the one scale to the next. Let's look at a very simple example here. Let's look at the two scales 0 0.2 and 0 0.4. There, nothing is happening here, maybe not too interesting, but the point here is, so there's a single cycle, there's a single interval containing both values and there's a unique cycle that's a, a generating cycle for homology, a, a basis cycle for homology in both situations. And to summarize, this diagram tells us everything we need to know about the entire uh, homology evolution at all scales in, in one shot. 
So we can read off all the dimensions and all the ranks between two different scales. And that's very powerful. And we can read it off just by looking at this, uh, this interval diagram, which we call the persistence barcode. And, okay, so let's just summarize in a formal way what we've seen here. Persistent homology is nothing but the homology of a filtration of simplicial complexes uh, or topological spaces. That means we have this one parameter family. We have a diagram of topological spaces indexed over the real numbers. We have a space per real number and we have an inclusion map for each pair of real numbers. And so that's our starting point. That's the filtration. We apply homology to this entire diagram. As I said, homology can be applied to spaces, but also to maps between spaces. And that means if we apply homology, we get another diagram. Now it's a diagram of vector spaces. We ca call such diagrams persistence modules. And we will assume, for a good reason, we work with finite samples, so the vector spaces will automatically be finite dimensional, which is very good because then we still understand things in the following way. Well, maybe let's just first summarize what persistence modules are and what their maps are. So this is very similar to the previous slide. We have, now we have a diagram of finite dimensional vector spaces indexed over the reals one for each real number, one linear map for each pair of real numbers. There's a notion of map, of morphism between such persistence modules, and that's this ladder-shaped diagram, right? So the persistence module is just a single real line, if you want, linear uh, sequence of vector spaces. Now, what's a, what's a reasonable notion of mapping between two such persistence modules? You build up a ladder-shaped diagram such that everything commutes. So you have a linear map from one from M S to M T uh, so to N S and from M T to N T and each possible square that you can form this way has to commute. So you have a compatible family of linear maps. That's a notion that we will try to use quite often. This, this is needed whenever we need to connect two different things. For example, the persistent homology of one shape and the persistent homology of another shape. There's there's maps between them and they're captured by these. Uh, natural transformations is, the, is the, the standard name in math for this. Okay, so, so these are persistence modules. These are the algebraic objects in which uh, we couch uh, our observation that uh, if we look at this shape at different scales, then homology is born and dies. And how, how, can, we, how can we grasp when exactly something is born and when it dies, and how can we tell, uh, how can we connect birth and death? Like this is like with humans. The person who was born is a baby, the person who dies is an old person, and it's, it may be non-trivial to connect up uh, which baby corresponds to the old person that dies. And that's kind of, we have the same situation here algebraically, uh, and interestingly there is a, there's a solution to this problem. And it's a bit different than for humans. Um, but it, we have a very satisfying way of, of connecting birth and death, at least. Uh, so we assume we have a persistence module. We have a, a real, uh, real indexed diagram of vector spaces, finite dimensional. Then this decomposes as a direct sum. Like a, a vector space de decomposes as a direct sum of copies of your field. And this is kind of the one parameter family version of this statement. So we have a direct sum of interval modules. That means this is a persistence module where uh, that's supported on an interval. So we have, we have an interval over which we we, a copy of our field appears. And then to the left or to the right, there might be zeros. Th th these zeros might be there or they might not be there. Sometimes they extend to infinity. The, the key point is you have to be supported on an interval. And crowley burvey showed here, this is a generalization of a fact that if you index over a finite set or over the natural numbers, this has been done before, but it's actually true also if you index over the reals. So we have in a, in a very general setting, whenever we parameterize in, in, over one parameter, we can decompose in, in such a way. Um, 
So, so that's, that's possible in a, in a unique way. And that gives us the barcode that we have seen before. The supporting intervals of these building blocks make up the persistence barcode that we've seen. And that's unique, even though the decomposition itself is not unique. It, the decomposition is not unique. You shouldn't be surprised because the same thing is true just for vector spaces already. If I have an n-dimensional vector space, I can write it as a direct sum of one-dimensional spaces in many ways. But of course, the dimension is well-defined. Just the, the decomposition is not well-defined, but it's essentially unique. We have the same thing here. So in a sense, this persistence barcode is the one parameter generalization of the notion of dimension, if you want, dimension of a vector space. Yeah, so that's, that's what the barcode captures. And the key point is it describes this persistence module uniquely up to isomorphism. So it's a complete invariant. We understand everything. And that's cool because this is, like the dimension describes the vector space, this is an object that's easy to describe, easy to work with. It's purely combinatorial if you want. And, and that's the reason why we are using, or well, one of the reasons why we're using homology with coefficients in a field, not with coefficients in the integers as people usually do in, in, in algebraic topology because we wouldn't have this kind of statement. We want to work with vector spaces and homology with coefficients in a field give us vector spaces over this field. Another thing to point out, it, it's tempting to try, I want to I wanna have more than one parameter. Many practitioners want to have two or three parameters for very good reasons. And unfortunately, if you're asking for one, more than one parameter, you don't have anything like this theorem here anymore. You lose this kind of simple structure. And if you're unlucky, you might have something very complicated and it just doesn't decompose anymore at all. It's, it's a very complicated persistence module over two parameters if you want, but you can't decompose it. And that might be true even though there's something very similar, some, some very similar input data gives you something that decomposes just as nice. So that's why for now, we're focusing on one parameter. There's a big, there's a big, we're kind of in a lucky situation to have this, this kind of simple structure here. And it's, if you just generalize a little bit, this simplicity goes, a very, uh, goes away very quickly. That's just important to keep in mind. And that's the reason why we're doing this like that, why we're working with vector spaces and why we're working over just one parameter. Because then we have something we don't have otherwise. This, this, uh, property of stability. Let me uh, sketch what this means. So here in the first version of this theorem that tells us persistent homology is something stable. The barcode is stable. This is uh, phrased in terms of functions, not geometric objects. We have two functions, f and g. We look at the sub-level sets of this, these functions. The sub-level set simply means all the points in the domain with a function value below a certain threshold. And if I increase the threshold, this also gives me a filtration of the domain. Eventually, I exhaust the entire domain. And I have a filtration, so I have persistent homology. So I can take two functions. And this statement says, if I, take, if I start with two similar functions, then I also get similar barcodes. Here, here's an illustration on the bottom right, there's a blue barcode and a red barcode. And the statement guarantees if the input functions that I haven't shown here, if the input functions are similar, then there will be a matching. So in, in a sense of, of combinatorics. So a partial bijection between the intervals and the two barcodes. And I put the matched intervals next to each other. Some are unmatched, right? Some there's a blue interval not, not matched with a red one, and vice versa. And what you see here, the matched intervals have similar endpoints, and the unmatched intervals, um, they are short. They're, so similar endpoints, let's say, within distance delta, if delta was the difference of the functions. And the unmatched intervals are short. That can be interpreted as you can match them to an empty interval they have similar endpoints to an empty interval. If you want this 
this expresses Lipschitz continuity, right? If you, if, if you pass from a function to a persistence barcode and you wiggle the function by this much, then the barcode will not wiggle by any more than that. So you have a Lipschitz constant of one. That's what stability means. Control an input gives you control on the output. And that's, that's, you can imagine, that's extremely powerful. Whenever you have a way of transforming data from something complicated to something, uh, something, some easier description, maybe with loss of information, but whenever you have control over how much you perturb the output, you know that your, your way of transforming your data is very powerful. And it can be used, so let's, let's go into maybe one of the most natural first applications of, of this whole theory, homology inference. Uh, we're given, like in the first slide of this talk, we're given a, a finite sample of a shape. The shape is unknown. We haven't, I haven't even shown you the shape, but let's say the shape was an annulus, and the points I've shown you, they, those are a sample, a, a finite subset of, of the points on this annulus. And you, you were asked to determine the homology of this annulus. Well, you're asked to determine that, that there's a single hole in this annulus. That's what I call homology inference. And this is a slightly weaker, or it actually substantially weaker version of, of the following problem. Uh, reconstruct the shape, construct the shape R that has the correct homology, the same homology as the space X. And uh, I should say something here. You should not just come up with any shape that has the correct homology, because once you guessed the homology correctly, you can just build up something that looks uh, very different from this, the shape X. But here, reconstruction actually asks uh, for a reconstruction R that's also geometrically close. And these, this geometric closeness can actually be expressed by maps from R to X and vice versa. And the requirement here is really that the isomorphism in homology should be expressed through these maps, geometric maps between the, the unknown shape X and its reconstruction R. So in that sense, you, you can already see in this reconstruction problem, I'm asking for quite a bit more than just in the inference problem. And as it turns out, the inference problem will be uh, much easier to solve because we have more freedom. We don't have to actually solve the problem in geometry. We just have to solve it in linear algebra and we have much more flexibility there. But let's see, okay, so our approach to solve this problem that we've seen at the beginning of this talk is we approximate the shape X by a thickening of the points, by this union of balls. I'm gonna denote this as P subscript delta, the delta, the union of delta balls centered at the points of P. And I just try to thicken it up enough so that this union of balls covers my unknown shape, right? And then I hope that this might actually capture the correct homology. If my sample is dense enough, it makes sense, right? I don't have to thicken too much, and I might get lucky and recover the shape. Uh, this actually works under some assumptions, but the assumptions are strong. And this is a famous theorem by Niogi, Smail, and Weinberger. It assumes that X is a manifold, a submanifold of Euclidean space. And then we have this assumption that I mentioned, the thickening of the point cloud P by delta should cover the manifold, and it should be lower than a certain quantity, a geometric quantity of uh, a geometric property of the manifold. That's kind of expressing curvature, but also how close parts of the manifold come to each other. That's the reach of the manifold. And so if your sample is dense enough, delta is in, in some sense the sampling density, right? How much have, do I have to thicken to cover the entire manifold X. And if this sampling density is small enough, then I can actually thicken by twice as much, and that thickening by twice as much gets rid of all the small holes that might appear at level delta. They might appear at delta, they will be gone at two delta. This is what their theorem shows. So under these assumptions, you can reconstruct. That's nice, yeah? But the, the requirements, having a submanifold and having this delta as small is actually quite strong because the reach is 
uh, controlled by the curvature. If the curvature is very small at some point, I lose control over this. So this is great, but not very useful in practice. And here's an example showing where this goes wrong already. Um, this is what I, I referred to at the beginning of the talk. Um, maybe you'll recognize this. So here's a point cloud of a curve, but here's the curve. And this point cloud looks perfectly reasonable, right? It's, it's not a bad approximation of the curve. And to the right, you see the persistence barcode. Let's see what happens if we thicken the balls. We let the, this union of walls grow. We see some hole appearing. You see it on the left. There's this small hole appearing here, here. And corresponding to that, there's an interval in the barcode that's lit up. That's here. And you can see this is a short-lived one. I, I increase the balls just slightly and, and the hole will go away. But of course, uh, at the same time, another hole appears to the right of it. And now you see what happens. Right? Whenever I try to fill a, a, one of these short-lived holes, another short-lived hole comes up. And this goes on up to the point where I'm creating a bridge between two different parts. Uh, of the shape that should be there. So there's no correct radius that, that just covers uh, this, this curve in a way that I only have the one hole that's cut out by the curve itself. There's always some mistake made by this reconstruction. Right? And that's why this theorem fails in this case. And the, of, clearly the assumptions are not satisfied by this example. But this, this is supposed to illustrate you that the sample has enough information to recover the homology of the curve. We just need to look at not only one scale at a time, we have to look at how the scales connect. We have to look at persistent homology. And now there's a, another theorem. This is about the same time as the other theorem. And this is much simpler, uh, much uh, weaker assumptions um, and, and it's much more powerful in practice hence. So we still have the, the same assumptions, uh, the, the first assumption is still the same. We have a parameter delta such that the thickening of the point cloud by delta covers the sh shape. And then we have two assumptions on homology, right? So uh, every map between spaces induces a map in homology. We have an inclusion map from X the, sh the unknown shape to its delta thickening, and then from the delta thickening of the unknown shape to its two delta thickening. And I'm just requiring that, that not too much happens in homology as I thicken my unknown shape, my curve. That, that's, that's a weaker assumption than the one I've shown before for the reach, just to say that much. And I will use this, this assumption in a moment very explicitly. And then I can get the homology of the shape X up to isomorphism, right? So I, I can recover this homology as the image of a map in homology. The image of the map induced by inclusion from one thickening of the point cloud to a larger thickening. So this is something I, I, I can compute just knowing the sample P and I, I need to construct the appropriate simplicial complexes, compute the inclusion map, and I get this induced mapping homology. And then just linear algebra, what's the, image, what's the rank of this map? This tells me what the dimension of the homology of X is. So this counts the number of holes. And the proof is so simple that I can just show it here on, uh, on half a slide. Because all I need to do is I need to collect the assumptions I made in, in a diagram and show you what happens. So this diagram exists because of my assumption that P delta covers X and P itself is a subspace of X. So P delta covers X means X is included in the delta thickening of P. And if P is a subspace of X, then the delta thickening of P is 
included in the delta thickening of x. That gives you the second map here, and so on. So the fact that we have these four inclusion maps is just rephrasing our assumptions. Okay, so this is what we start with, and we call this an interleaving, and will uh, become a good friend of us, this kind of zigzag passing between two different spaces, in this case, between x and p, and their thickenings. Okay, we apply homology to this zigzag of spaces, and now we have two, two more assumptions. We have an assumption that a certain map is bijective, another map is injective, right? And these are the maps in, induced by these inclusions. That's what I'm gonna use. And now we just use some very basic linear algebra. So let's look at the first, uh, the first map here, the, the, the horizontal map on the left. And this is, this is injective and surjective. And it's the composition, because this diagram commutes, it's the composition of the zigzag, the two maps going down and up again. If, if the composition of two maps is surjective, then certainly the second map in this composition is surjective. Let me mark this by drawing this double headed arrow. Right? So this is also the, the map in homology from P delta to X delta is guaranteed to be surjective. And we have a similar situation on the right. The map from X delta to P2 delta is injective. Now, if you're familiar enough with basic linear algebra, you, this tells you something. I have a map here. So the composition of these two maps that we just understood a bit better is a composition of a surjection followed by an injection. These are linear maps. What does this tell us about the object in the middle? Whenever I have a surjection followed by an injection in linear maps, then the guy in the middle is isomorphic to the image of this map. And now you're done, right? We didn't do anything but collect facts, but now we have this isomorphism between this image, and that's isomorphic to homology of x delta, which by assumption was isomorphic to the homology of x. So this is an, almost a non-proof. But this is all you need to show that you can infer the homology of a shape from a sample using these simple assumptions. So that's very powerful. And we see some concepts um, emerging from, from this kind of argument. So this zigzag between different spaces is going to come up again in a moment. Okay. Any questions about this proof before we proceed? Okay, so the question was how can we find the, the right radius? And that's, uh, that's a very good question. I mean, you, ha you would have to guess it somewhere from the input. And there's no, as far as I know, there's no, there's no principled good way of finding the correct radius if you don't have it already. So, I mean, if you want to apply this to data, you would have to, I guess, you would have to guess the, the correct radius or you would somehow assume that you know how you produce your sample. And so there are methods for sampling a shape that comes with guarantees on, on, on the sampling density, I would call this delta. And if you, and you use, you can use that guarantee. But otherwise you would may, maybe take an educated guess. That's a very good question. So, so it's kind of, for this method it's required to, to know to know a property of the shape. Because if you just have the sample, there's many, and you don't know the shape X, there might be many different shapes that produce the sample. So it's, it's an ill-posed question to expect to have a, a principled way of guessing the radius that always works. You need to know, you need to have extra information. Second question, yeah. So the question was, can we use this method with incremental data? I guess you, 
yeah you you could you i mean you can you can recompute the, the entire barcode i mean so what you would do in practice you would look at the barcode and you would you would see something you would see that at some place um a, a feature seems to appear that that uh that remains stable for a while and if, if your sample is good enough, you will see something like that. You will see, you will literally be able to see uh, the delta at which the correct homology appears. Maybe we will, we'll, I can show you this uh, later when we get to the computations. And so I guess if, if, I mean, if your process of data acquisition allows you to acquire more data, then you could of course work incrementally. <clears throat> okay. How 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 this can be used in practice? In in practice, it could be used if, for some reason, you have a way, a controlled way of sampling. And for example, there are uh, programs for sampling algebraic varieties, and you can actually give as an input. I, I wanna so you can compute uh, the. the the required radius and you can ask the program to produce a sample that goes below that radius and then you can just say okay I'm now I'm sure right? the other way you would use it you would just hope that uh, that your sample is fine enough and you would try to guess this this correct value of delta I guess that's the more common way it's used in practice So you don't need to re literally go through several values of delta, but what you usually do, the, the point is these, uh, all this information is encoded in the persistence barcode. So you look at the persistence barcode and you look for a place where, uh, where uh, bars appear that, that are long enough, that persist for long enough such that they actually contribute to this image here. Right? In order, like a bar contributes to the image uh, of delta to two delta, if the ratio between death and birth is greater than two. Yeah, yeah, right. I, that that makes sense because we let's go back there. We have an example here, right? So there's one interval that's quite long, and the ratio of death and birth for this interval is clearly uh, more than two. The other ones have a shorter ratio, so they don't contribute to the image. Uh, so, and that that uh, from that picture, you would guess that the correct choice of delta is somewhere here, right? So, somewhere close to where the the red interval starts. And I've I've drawn two lines here, and I've drawn two uh, unions of balls on top of each other that actually give you a choice. Of, uh, of of the parameter delta that 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 fits this theorem, but basically your 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 question aims at the same problem. In order to apply this theorem in practice, really, like, to to know that you can apply it, you need to know that your sample satisfies a certain criterion, and that might be challenging in practice. But there there might be situations where you have this. But even if you don't know that this works in practice. It's still good to know that uh, you have a method that behaves well under certain assumptions. And then in practice, you just hope that the assumptions are satisfied. But what you're guaranteed is you have a robust method. And now the data is to blame in, in a sense, but not the method. So I guess that's, that's, that's all I can say about this question. It's, it's, it's really hard to actually get guarantees um, for a, a data analysis process because you need guarantees on the method and on the data. We can only, of course, we can only provide guarantees on the methods. And whoever comes up with the data needs to provide the appropriate guarantees on the data. And, and that's that's why why well this is this is just to illustrate that that why we trust this method. But but it's not it's not going to be often that you have data and you'll know that the sampling conditions are satisfied. Okay. <clears throat> but we, initially I talked about homology inference, which we can do with this method. 
looking at two scales, right? We don't construct one shape, but we reconstruct two shapes. And only the holes that the two shapes have in common are the, the holes that we're interested in. That's the point. And of course, it's natural to ask for the harder problem, the reconstruction problem. And, and since we look, we, we do the inference based on a pair of spaces, and the homology we reconstruct lies in the middle as the image of the inclusion map. Now it's a natural question to, to ask for, maybe we can find a space sandwich in between that has the correct homology that realizes this, this, uh, this image of the map, right? If, if I have, if I have a, a, a third complex, like I have two complexes, L and K, and if I can find a third complex X in between, such that the homology of this complex is isomorphic to the image of the map from L to K, then this, this must, uh, must uh, capture exactly what, what I've, I've done just on the algebraic level. But now I rea I'm realizing this as a complex. So in a sense, this is always, this is the, the smallest number uh, that, that can, the smallest dimension uh, in homology that can be possibly achieved by any complex because, because the map has to factor through the, the map from L to K in homology has to factor through this space X to, through any space that lies in between, that's nested in between. So we're asking, is it possible so we see this image in, in algebra. Is it possible to also see it in geometry? Can, yeah. Oh yeah, so, so the double, this is, this is kind of a standard um, notation, but it's worth uh, mentioning. So this always means surject, two, two arrowheads means surjective, and the hook means injective. So this means we have, again, as before, we have an, a surjection followed by an injection. And that means, that always means that the thing in the middle is basically the image of this map. This is the bottleneck. We go down in dimension and then we go up again, right? And the, 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 sorry, yeah, double arrow with a hook is bijection because it's both injection and surjection, right? So. This is kind of, this is like an hourglass of linear algebra, right? You have something to the left, something smaller in the middle, something bigger to the right. Then the dimension of the thing in the middle is always the rank of this map from left to right. <laughs> and the point here is we want to realize this rank of the map as, as, as a space, right? We want to have this appear as a space that's required to send, be sandwiched between K and L. It's a subspace of K, but it includes L. Let me show you a picture of what, what I'm expecting. So here are two spaces, K and L. Both have two holes, but there's only one hole that persists. That's the, the hole in the middle, if you want, right? In, it's a pentagon hole in L, and it gets a bit smaller in K. And then in L, to the right, there's another hole that's filled up. And in K, there's a new hole that hasn't been there in L. So the rank of this homology inclusion map is one, corresponding to the only hole that persists from left to right, yeah? And so the question is, can you find a space, a subspace of K that includes L, and that has only this one hole? Yes, you can. Here's, here's one such space, oops. So this is one space X that only fills the hole on the right, but doesn't create the hole on the left. Now you might get overly ambitious and say this has to work always. We just go one dimension higher and we see a problem. So is this, is this okay? We, this is exactly what I'm looking for. I'm trying to fill the non-persistent hole, but I'm trying to not, without making the other non-persistent hole appear. This is the only persistent hole from L to K. And here's what goes wrong when you go to higher dimensions. Also still a very simple example. L has one hole, it's kind of a, a, a water 
tap, and then in K, there's another hole, it's a handle on top, the, but the hole of L is filled. So nothing persists from K to L. No homology is present in both. So the dimension that I'm trying to construct in the middle should be zero. In other words, I'm looking for a shape, including L contained in K, that has no hole. And let's see why that is not possible. I have to fill this hole in L. I have only one way to fill it using synthesis from K. Namely, I have to in include the three triangles. And here's the problem with that. The, triangle have ed the triangles have edges. The dimensions are not independent. So I can't include the triangles without also including the edges. But when I include this edge here, one of the edges forms the second hole. So the fact that the different dimensions here interfere with each other, and this is not visible in homology. In, in linear algebra, uh, you don't see this, but in geometry you see it. And that's, that's why there's, a, there's this extra link that, that's present in geometry, not in, in algebra. And, uh, and that's basically the, the reason why, in certain cases, you might not be able to reconstruct what you see uh, just on the level of homology, also on the level of algebra. Uh, sorry, reconstruct that in a geometric level. And it turns out that if you basically you, you, you beef up this example and you can show that the question whether this is possible or not is actually an NP-hard problem. You can build up gadgets basically from, from this construction and make a reduction from three set. And that's, this is a three-dimensional um, uh, example and it turns out even for 3D shapes, this problem is NP-hard. And that's kind of sad because one of the reasons, one of the motivations for me to look into this question is the following. I, I, I wanted to, I thought that, that studying medical images um, is, like, has, has certain topological problems. That this, this is what happens if you take a raw medical image and you draw a sublevel set. You see a lot of dust. And that's kind of a topological artifact. There's a lot of uh, disconnected, like a, a lot of small connected components in this sublevel set. And if I modify the function just a little bit, there's a lot of critical points in the sense, in the, in the, in the brightness function of this image. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask for uh, another image nearby, like modifying the, the intensity values just by a little bit, but trying to eliminate these, these spurious uh, topological features creating something like this maybe, yeah? And that's, uh, so that, that, that's a problem that's related to what I've shown before in the following way. We can, um, we can, F here, we can consider F as the brightness of our image. And we're given such an image, we're given a function F, we try to look for another function um, that has the simplest possible homology for a fixed, for a fixed sublevel set. So I'm trying to get rid of as many connected components and as many small loops and holes as possible in this image. And the, the relation to the previous problem is, well, if I have, let's say I fix my tolerance um, specifying how much I allow myself to modify the image. This is my delta here. And so I'm, if, I, if I'm looking for a function g, a modified function g within distance delta, it has, so the t sublevel set of this function delta has to contain the t minus delta sublevel set of, of the original image of f, and it has to be contained in the t plus delta sublevel set of that original function. So we have a similar situation as before, and we're trying to minimize the homology of G. Well, a lower bound is given by the rank of the in inclusion-induced map, right? Because uh, this inclusion map factors through G. 
but that induces a map in, in, in homology. So the, also the map, in, the map in homology from f t minus delta to t plus delta factors through g t. So the rank of this map will always be at most what, what happens in, in, in any factor that that you can obtain in if you if you uh, if you write this map from f t minus delta to t plus delta as a composition of two maps, right? You write it as a composition of the map from f t minus delta to g t composed with a map from g t to t to f t plus delta. So we have we have a lower bound. We we know, in other words, we know that it, fixing fixing delta. Um, Everything, everything that persists from f t minus delta to t plus delta has to be present in any g. But these are the features I can't possibly get rid of. And now we've seen um, the, 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 problem, uh, the, the problem from before told us it's NP hard to decide whether we, we can achieve this bound. Which means this problem asking for simplifying a 3D picture is also an NP-hard problem. Because I, I, I have a simple lower bound that I can calculate just using linear algebra. I just have to compute the rank of some linear map. But it's NP-hard to decide whether I can achieve this lower bound. So that's kind of bad news in a sense. But at least this tells us how quickly we run into hard problems. If we actually want to do reconstruction on the geometric level. In, in other, uh, on the other hand, if, if for some reason it's enough for you to stay with, with whatever you compute in the algebraic world, then things remain simple. So that's, that's one of the things you can learn from this. So also this problem here is NP. Okay, here's, here's another uh, fun example that, that's kind of similar in spirit, but only in 2D. So here you see, uh, uh, a terrain. You see, you, maybe you can guess how many mountains you see here. How many peaks? It's easier if I also show the contour lines, and then you see that it's not easy at all in this case because there's many local maxima. Once you see the contours, you you see an estimate for how many local maxima this contour has. It has very many, but if you look at a map, you will see that there may be. A, just three of these peaks have names. Why do they have names? Because they are persistent, right? The, the elevation from the peak to the closest saddle is quite large, and that's what you would consider a peak. So there's a relationship to persistent homology. And what I wanted to do is to modify the, the map in a way that you only see true peaks. So let's, let's see, let's go back here, and then look very closely. I'm gonna change the image in a way that almost won't be noticeable. So this is after, this is before. You see the coloring changes, but the shading almost doesn't change. This is, this is on purpose. And let me just show the contour lines of the modified picture. Now you see, you can look for peaks, and there should be only three. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the one that's clean, clearly detectable. There's another one somewhere here. I think. It's not so easy still to detect the peaks, but if you stare at this picture for a while, you will see that there, there are actually only three peaks left in this picture. So what, what I did here is I looked at the following problem, which is similar to the one before. We given this function, now it's the height function, we fix a tolerance, and now we're looking for another function, f delta nearby, that minimizes the number of critical points. And the critical points of the function are related to the topology of the sublevel sets. This is, this is Morse theory uh, setting up this relation. So there's an inequality. The, the number of critical points is, a, is an upper bound for the dimension of homology. And Morse theory sets up this relationship between critical points of sublevel sets, uh, critical points of a function and their sublevel sets. It also has a powerful method that, that, that's been used in the proof of the Poincaré conjecture in higher dimensions. And this is a sketch from a book by Milner uh, describing this proof. 
and it, it goes as follows. If you have, so what's sketched here is the gradient vector field of the function with respect to some metric. And what you see here is two critical points, P and P prime, and they're connected by a unique, a single gradient flow line. Where's the pointer? Here, here's the gradient flow line. That's just one. If there's just one gradient flow line, then Morse proved that you can change the vector field in a neighborhood of this gradient flow line and reverse the arrows and in, a, in effect eliminating these two critical points. This is what you see on the right. You turn things around and the two critical points that have been there on the left have been canceled and vanished in the right picture. Yeah? And that's, so in a sense, Morse theory gives you a way of canceling pairs of critical points. Persistent homology relates the homology of different sublevel sets, not just, not just uh, locally, but globally. We, we can look at uh, sublevel sets that are arbitrarily far apart. It also identifies pairs of critical points, and it quantifies their persistence. That's, that's the difference in function value. So there's a certain analogy here, but they're not talking really about the same thing. Most theory makes stronger statements and takes stronger assumptions. So there's a, a certain mismatch, but the mismatch only shows up in higher dimensions. What I've shown before was in dimension two on surface, and there's something interesting you can actually do. This is why I could show you this picture. Uh, in, in dimension two, you have the following. Well, in, in general, you have the following statement. The, the intervals in the barcode, the persistence barcode of a function, uh, give you a lower bound on the number of critical points of any nearby function. They tell you how stable critical points are. So if you look at just the intervals that are longer than two delta, you can't get rid of them if you modify the function by delta. You can possibly shrink the interval from, from both ends, but if, it's, if the interval is longer than two delta, you can't shrink it enough that it actually vanishes. So that's why uh, those intervals that are long enough in F, they have to be present in G still. That's how you get this lower bound. And the question is here, can you achieve this lower bound? In, in 2D you can. You can, you can cancel all the critical points. In, in higher dimensions it's no longer possible. But this is what you have seen in this illustration with the, with the mountain peaks. So this is something that works only on surfaces. Okay. Um, Um, I, I want to go to the topic of stability and, and explain more why we have stability of persistence barcodes. Let's just see what we, what we did on the first few slides. We started with a point cloud. The first step we did implicitly was we pass to the distance function to this point cloud. This is the function in, in the ambient space that assigns to each point in ambient space the distance to its nearest point in the point cloud P. And if I take sub-level sets of that function, like sub-level set at level R is exactly the union of balls of radius R around the points. Right? So I can express the construction of union of balls as a sub-level sub set of a distance function. And that's kind of an intermediate step. As I said, in, in the first proof of stability started at the level of functions. And this way you can, you can view the geometric example starting with point clouds just as a special case. So it, we, we go from point clouds to functions and then we construct sub-level sets and we get a filtration. We're in the, in the world of topology. We get a filtration index over the reals and then we apply homology. We get this persistence module, which is a complicated object that gets we get a very simple uh, understanding of this complicated object once we compute the persistence barcode. And the key point here is each of these four steps is stable in a sense. We have metrics on the objects in, in all five levels. We have metrics on point clouds, that's the Hausdorff distance. You can compare uh, shapes in Euclidean space using the Hausdorff distance. And if we pass from an object in Euclidean space to its distance function, 
And the distance function, we also have a metric that's the L-infinity norm-induced metric. And the house of distance equals, between the two objects, equals the infinity distance of the distance functions. That's, if you want, that could be one way of defining the house of distance. And then we pass to the next step, we pass to filtrations. And then on that level, now we have objects in some of, 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 of a certain type, in, of a certain category. Here's topological spaces indexed over the reals. For any such diagram, we have a notion, a nice notion of metric that's the interleaving distance. And you see from that on, we have, uh, we have diagrams of this shape uh, throughout. We also have uh, persistence modules, diagrams of vector spaces, and the barcodes can also be interpreted as diagrams of uh, in, in a, of objects of a certain category, the category of matchings, that is. Let me just illustrate very quickly. Um, but yeah, b b before we go there, just to summarize the first proof of stability, assume we start with a function and went straight to the stability of the persistence barcodes. What we're going to show here and what turned out to be very useful is to realize that there's actually several steps in between. And in some cases, so this, this has actually also found applications in symplectic geometry, and they, uh, the symplectic geometers are heavily using the stability, passing only from persistence modules to intervals. So in some cases, you want to enter the stage, uh, this picture at a later stage. The kind of, the f more fine grained you understand how, how this whole pipeline is stable, the more knowledge you have and the more applicable your, your understanding will be. So that's why we're gonna look at this last arrow, which is actually the hard part. But I think that's the part where you can actually see something. Let me briefly explain what matching, category of matchings are. So we're passing through different categories here. We have talked about topological spaces and the maps between topological spaces of continuous maps. Then we had vector spaces and linear maps. And here we have something that doesn't really have maps, but we consider the objects as sets, and then there are morphisms are something matchings between the sets. And, uh, and we have a composition. So this is, uh, if, if you have a blue set and a red set and a, and a yellow set here, and then you see how you compose the matchings. So a blue object is matched to a yellow object if and only if there is a common red object to which um, the blue and the yellow are matched. So this defines composition in this category. And that, so, so that means we are, we're looking for a diagram of sets. And when we have two different sets, we wanna have a matching between the two. How can we interpret uh, a persistence barcode in, in that sense? We already did, I'm just repeating what we did at, at the beginning of the talk. If I look at a barcode and I wanna read off the homology at a given uh, level T, I, I take the collection of all the intervals containing T, that's my set at one index, and then if I wanted to read off the rank of a map between two levels, S and T, I looked at all the intervals that contain both S and T, and that means basically I'm, I'm, I have a matching between the set of intervals containing S and the set of intervals containing T, so there's a partial a subset of both, and that gives me a partial conjunction. On the other hand, let's let's say I start with a diagram of matching, so I have a sequence of sets, and they're pairwise matched up in some way. Then you, you can see. I, I guess I don't have to make this formal. You can see. You can just trace these these different matching edges. They they combine to form an interval, and that that's how. If you have such a diagram of matchings, you can take equivalence classes look at the support, you, you, you can actually read off uh, the intervals. You can read off a barcode from this diagram. So this is a different language uh, of, expressing, um, of expressing barcodes. I can view them as a collection of intervals, or I can view them, them as a diagram of matchings, as a diagram index over the reals. And the reason why we like this is because also the filtrations and persistence modules are diagrams of the same shape, and we kind of live in the same world. Okay, the notion of interleavings is very important to us, and we, we have seen this in the proof before. Let me just 
uh, show a, a geometric illustration of this. We have a point cloud in blue, we have another one in red. They are close in Hausdorff distance. That means uh, the red point cloud, which is not very visible anymore, but it's still there. It's covered now entirely by the blue balls of a certain radius. And vice versa, the blue point cloud is covered by the red balls. And this is also something I mentioned before. The red balls of radius R and delta here, let's say, are again covered by the blue balls of radius 2 delta. And those are again covered by the red balls of radius 3 delta. So what you see, what you see here is, again, this is a geometric instance of an interleaving relation. We go zigzag between blue and red, increasing the scale in, at each step. And that's just making th the same thing formal here, talking about functions. So we, we have two functions, f and g. Their infinity distance is delta. And capital FT is my notation for the sub-level set of F at the level T and similar for G. And then we have a diagram like this, right? You see, this is exactly what you've seen before. We go zigzag between FT, GT plus delta, FT plus two delta, and so on. That's what we call an interleaving. By the way, this is not just, this doesn't exist just for the arrows that we have shown here, but, but this exists for all t, and everything should commute, right? So that you could draw many more arrows uh, at every index. So at every index r, let's say, you could also go through, uh, from f at index r, you go to g at index r plus delta, and all the arrows that you could draw in this diagram this way, uh, everything should commute. So in a sense, we, I mentioned the notion of morphism, of persistence modules, you have two morphisms of persistence modules. They go this way, they go from F to G, shifting degrees by delta, and another one from G to F, also shifting degree by delta. Okay, so this is, this is an interleaving diagram. This tells us if I find such a diagram, then F and G are close to being isomorphic, they are similar. And how small I can get this delta gives me a notion of distance between F and G between these two diagrams. That, that's the interleaving distance. Now what, what's really nice about this, I take this interleaving diagram of two filtrations and I apply homology. I can apply homology to any commutative diagram. It will remain commutative because that's a property, a general property of functors and that's the most important. That's why people in, like functors so much because they, they, they don't break things. And that, that's what I can do here. I can apply homology and I get another commutative diagram. So immediately I know if two filtrations are delta interleaved, if the interleaving distance between two filtrations is at most delta, the same thing is true for their persistent homology. That's a stability, one of the stability statements. Passing from filtrations to persistent homology is stable with no proof, right? It's just because I can apply functors and they preserve commutative diagrams. That's great, so we would like to prove everything in that way, not having to prove anything, right, for free. But, but that's not gonna work anyway. Uh, so, but that's, that's the core of the, of the stability statement. Now, if we have two persistence modules and they are delta interleaved, then there exists a delta matching of the barcode. So this is kind of the algebraic version of the stability theorem that we have seen before. And it's, it's, it's equivalent to saying that there is a delta interleaving of the barcodes if we interpret them as diagrams of matchings. So we, we would like to show this, this algebraic stability theorem using the same strategy, by right? passing from filtrations to persistent homology, we got for free because we know this is just applying homology functor. Can we also do the same thing? Can we pass from a persistence module to its barcode by applying a, some magic functor that passes from vector spaces to matchings and maybe produces the barcode? And that would preserve interleavings. That would show us the theorem. But this guy said no, there's no free lunch. Um, and, and that would be a free lunch, apparently. So why is it not possible? I think there's some, some very fundamental thing to understand. If, if there was a, a functor of that kind, 
and it would send a vector space of dimension d, uh, of dimension d to a set with d elements. That's basically asking for choosing a basis of a vector space in a compatible way, in a, in a way that's compatible with linear maps. And it also sends a linear map of rank R to a matching where R elements are matched. And this proposition here, which is rather elementary, says you can't choose a basis for a vector space in a canonical way. This is, this is kind of the, the core, this is why, why it's not that easy. We, we, can't, we can't simply combinatorialize linear algebra without losing information. This is what we're trying to do here. But we, we get somewhere with the following observation. That, that's, a, that's a very uh, crucial observation here. We look at epimorphisms of persistence modules. What is that? So we, you understand what persistence modules are. They are one parameter families of vector spaces. And an epimorphism is simply a morphism of persistence modules, so these ladder-shaped diagrams. And in each index, I have a surjective map. Right? From going from bottom, uh, top to bottom is always a surjection. And as before, this is a commutative diagram. So going from S, MS to NS, and then to NT is the same as from MS to MT and then to NT. So that's my setting. And if I have such a picture, I know something I know exactly what happens to the barcodes. And if you don't want to read it, just look at the picture. This is what the barcode will look like. The blue one is the barcode of M, and the yellow one is the barcode of N. They have the same birth times. They are aligned at the left, and they're shrunk from the right. It makes sense, in a sense, if you look at the statement, because uh, all the maps at each index are surjections, meaning the dimension will decrease. But this exactly tells you how the, how the barcodes are related. And that's a, that's a strong relationship between the barcodes, right? If, if, you, if you don't know anything uh, about the connection between M and N, then maybe, maybe it's hard to say how the barcodes relate. But if, if they are connected by surjections, then this statement actually gives you a matching between the intervals. This is what we need to, to get to the stability statement. We want to say there is a matching of the intervals that matches only similar intervals. Well, we have something on, on the left-hand side, they're they are even equal. The left endpoints are even equal. That's too much to ask for. On the other, the, the right-hand side, we have an inequality. We need two inequalities. But you can believe me, right? If you know, if you have something like that, you, you're halfway there. Because now we, we know what we can do for epimorphisms, for, for surjections. What, what about a general linear map? How, how, and, and it respects composition, that's also important. And there's a dual statement for injections. So for injections, the right endpoints will be aligned. What can we do for general morphisms, general linear maps? We have seen this before today. If I have a general linear map, I can factor it through the image. And I get a surjection followed by an injection. But I know, I understand both parts. I understand surjections, I know how the barcodes behave there. And I understand injections. And I get matchings from both, and I can compose them. That's what you see here. So this is an illustration. I have two barcodes for M and N. There is a morphism between the persistence modules, some F, some family of linear maps. And all I show you about this morphism is what the barcode of the image looks like. Maybe one thing worth noting, the image of a morphism is itself a persistence model. It's itself a vector space in each index. Okay? And studying surjections, the surjection from M to the image of F gives me a matching of intervals, and then from image F to N gives me another matching, and you see in this illustration, I just composed the two matchings, and that means there's one long interval in I, one long interval in J, and they're matched up by this, because the interval in the image of F has the same left endpoint as that estate of M, and the same right endpoint as that of N. Okay, and I guess, 
I, I was a bit overly ambitious with, with these slides, but I, I, I will finish by showing how this construction gives you all you need to see stability, and then I'll stop there for today. But this is, this is really all you need. We're, we're gonna apply this kind of composing the matchings we get from surjections and, and injections. We're gonna apply it to an interleaving. Okay, so here's my interleaving between M and N. I'm just showing one, uh, some part of this. And actually I'm interested, so first note that the internal map in N, right, in, in each persistence module, there are maps between any vector spaces. And the map from N T minus delta to N T plus delta factors as G T minus delta followed by F T. That's important. Because what I know is the image of that N map, that horizontal map, is contained in the image of F. Because this map, it, the map factors this way. And let, let me just write down here what I need. So I'm, I'm inserting the images of these two maps one the image of F, T, and one the image of the horizontal map. And what I just said is the image of the horizontal map is contained, so green is contained in the image of F, T, yellow. So you see things that we understand already. Three injections where we know what the barcode behaves and one surjection, we also know where the barcode behaves. And again, we're just collecting facts that we know already. So let's assume we have an interval of n. And let's assume it's long enough so it, it, won't, uh, it won't shrink away to zero. Let's say this is an interval longer than two delta. The first thing is, in the lower right corner, you see n plus, n t plus delta. So we actually, we look at the persistence module with indices shifted by delta. That means on the level of barcodes, we're moving the bar to the left by delta. So that's another barcode of the persistence module, n delta, n shifted by delta. And now, because this is the persistence module that we can relate the image of f and the image of this internal n shift map. The image of f is a, is a sub-module. At each index, it's a subspace of n t plus delta. So the right endpoints are aligned and the left endpoints move to the right. And again, we have that the green persistence module, now this is, this is simply on the level of barcodes, this is simply the barcode that you get if you start with n and you shrink all intervals from both ends by delta. That's exactly what the barcode of this image is. Right now, now you have control over the left endpoint of the yellow interval from both ends because you know it's sandwiched. Somehow the same concepts in this talk appear again and again in different places. Here we sandwich the image of F between N shifted by delta and this, this uh, green image from T minus delta to T plus delta. So now we have, we have both inequalities, but we also know that this left endpoint of the yellow interval is exactly the same as the left end, end point of some interval in M. And this is exactly how we assemble the matching. So the, the initial interval from, from N is matched to this interval in M that we just obtained. And we know that their endpoints are similar. The left endpoints are within distance delta. So this is the, the same argument. Uh, you can also dualize and apply the same argument and obtain the statement about the right endpoints. And eventually this shows you why this method is robust and why the endpoint, why you have control over the endpoints once you have an interleave. And to summarize, when you have two similar point clouds, you have an interleaving of filtrations just by the assumption that they are geometrically close. And this interleaving passes on to an interleaving of persistence modules and this argument here shows you that the, there is a matching. This interleaving of persistence modules gives you a matching of the barcodes. Okay, uh, let me stop here. Uh, or maybe maybe I can just get two more minutes uh, to mention something that you will use in the tutorial this afternoon. Um, 
you will you will look at, at uh, ways of constructing uh, uh, persistence barcode from point clouds, and there's a simple construction uh, similar to what we have seen in the beginning of the talk with the union of balls. It's called a RIPS complex. So your input is just a distance matrix. We don't need Euclidean geometry, and the RIPS complex is an abstract simplicial complexes, and the simplex S is spanned. Um, is, is formed by a subset of the points in your in your point cloud X, uh, wh whose diameter is at most t. So so the longest edge between any pairs in S is is uh, less than t. So this gives you uh, possibly a very large construction, a very large complex. But that's what we, what the computation uh, will be based on. And I'm just going to show you an example. Uh, computation based on this. Um, I sampled uh, about 200 points on a two-dimensional sphere, a sphere in, in three dimensions, so two-dimensional surface. Uh, it's worth pointing out that th this whole construction already involves about 50 million simplices. So it's a, it's a very expensive operation. You have 200 points. You have, this uh, explodes to 50 million simplices. But that's because you have to you have to go, there's kind of a combinatorial explosion happening because you have to work with three-dimensional simplices to see what what are two-dimensional boundaries. And there's, different code has been developed for persistent homology over the years. You see big improvements. Let me just show you uh, what a uh, software that I wrote is capable uh, for, for this problem. So you can, oops. Is this, is this, yeah? I, I just need an internet connection. Maybe, I, so, so the, the point is what, what I'm showing here is the website live.ripsa.org where you can just go and uh, you, all you need is a distance matrix in, in uh, space or comma separated uh, uh, file format, so you 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 just put the matrix in a, in a file, and you upload it to this website. It actually runs in your browser. It's using a WebAssembly, and and then it, it computes the persistence barcode uh, on your. So yeah, maybe I should. No, this won't work. It's my computer. <laughs> okay, but, but maybe I can just show you a bit. This is not a. Yeah, here, here's another data set. It's not the sphere that I, I wanted to show you, but another one that we'll get to in a moment. But you, you, you upload the distance matrix here. Uh, let's just do this. I think this should work. So I want to load uh, the mentioned distance matrix of the sphere. And here, here you can specify up to which radius you want to compute persistence. I will just complete, compute everything. And here you specify the dimensions that you're interested in. So this is a sphere. So you should see something in dimension two. And everything else, you should see something one, one long bar in dimension two corresponding to the hole that's described by the sphere. And everything else is noise. So everything you see in dimension one is noise. In a sense, those are sampling artifacts. And here is the two-dimensional class that, that's kind of the fundament, the orientation of the sphere itself. And you can play with this yourself. And in the afternoon, there, there will be another Python package, a Python wrapper around this code to play with. And, and, and so you can use a Jupyter notebook to, to run the same code in a Python interface. OK, thanks. <laughs>